the screen. Yeah, okay. So let's start. So as uh, Dominique said, uh, today we will be talking about uh, this uh, regional archaeological project in the Konya Plain, which lasted for five years. Uh, this was uh, our last uh, field work. And uh, I was um, directing it in collaboration with Christoph Bahuber and Fatma Shaheen and James Osborne. And the same, with the same people, we are now hoping to get an excavation uh, in one of the sites that we uh, discovered. And I will talk a little bit more about that. And uh, just be before uh, starting uh, anything else, I mean, I just wanted to, to point that this is actually quite a big interdisciplinary team. And these are just the main uh, uh, people that are working um, uh, in collaboration with us. And, and so we have a lot of different branches of, of this survey. And actually, um, well, one of the main aims of, of today's uh, talk, in line with the, what the, the, the general uh, topic of the course is, is to, to showcase how uh, regional surveys can be extremely um, useful to, to, uh, in conjunction with excavation and complementary to excavation to understand uh, broader patterns um, and, and archaeological processes. And, uh, you know, I say this specifically because I think in Turkey, this is still not um, uh, thought of as, as this. I mean, most, most of, of survey projects, if you look at the just to make an example, they are uh, conceived as a sandbox for junior uh, scholars to, to sort of uh, learn things before going into the real uh, job which is excavating and uh, I will try to show that that is not necessarily the case that you can do um, a lot uh, with a survey and you can stay for the whole life as, as a surveyor if you want to and just to give you a framework of uh, how many slides there is going to be and what I'm going to talk about so I will briefly discuss what is our conceptual framework and then discuss a little bit of how we, we did we did things and then because of the, the, the nature of, of our work, I mean, I will talk about, about, about what we know of the ancient landscapes. And then I will talk about the, the archaeological results, which is what is mostly this talk is about. Um, and um, uh, Dominique uh, asked me to, to uh, talk for like 60 minutes, a little bit more than 60 minutes. Uh, Dominique, if you want, we can uh, split in half. I have a point where we, we can split enough. Um, what do you think? No, I think you, you just uh, do as you, you wish to do. I mean, we are not uh, really looking for our time. Okay, okay. So want. let's, all right, let's start. So first off, what, what drove us um, to, to, to conceive uh, such a project? And I think that is, this, this project is really embedded in, uh, in landscape archaeology which um, I'm not sure that, that, that you know what it is exactly. It is a, a field of archaeology uh, that is very much concerned with understanding uh, the, 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 the relationship between human communities and their surrounding environments uh, in the past and the interaction between different groups of uh, human groups, let's say, between, uh, uh, in, in, in the landscape, though. No, not in, in the abstract, in the landscape. And, uh, one of the major strengths of landscape archaeology, and I will try to show during the presentation, is that it, it provides a diachronic um, perspective on, on this on this interaction and these you know, relationships. And um, normally it provides this at a scale which is larger than the, the, the single site uh, and, and the, the single excavation, if you wish. So it is supra or uh, yeah, a supra settlement in, in, in scope. And it is also, not necessarily only, but also uh, focusing on the, the space between settlements. So really the landscape, how the landscape acts uh, for uh, human societies, but also um, in synergy with human societies to, 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 to shape human behavior. And uh, again, I will try, I hope that I will be able to, to show you how this approach can be uh, very useful and complementary with we know, what we normally 
get from excavation. And just to, 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 to nail the, the point here is, I want to, 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 to say that excavation has, um, uh, when, you, when you sort of excavate an area, you have a lot of detail that you cannot get from survey because you understand uh, in a lot more detail what, what past people were doing, how they were living, how they were building things, how they were making things. And you generally, if you are excavating well, you have a high rate of resolution chronologically, maybe 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, but you, you, you have a, a good command of how things develop in time. What you don't have is a big area to, to, to understand. And most excavations, um, they are focusing on very, very small excavated areas, maybe 1%, 0.5% of the whole um, site, right? So you need to be lucky uh, to, to, to first to understand something about that site. But also, even if you, if you put a lot of energy, a lot of uh, uh, money and time, you will always see a very small uh, window of what existed at the time. Conversely, uh, our regional surveys have a very low level of detail because you, you, what you see is what is on the surface. And most of that is pottery and chipstone. And if you're lucky, you find other sorts of material evidence. But that, that is in general very little. And also you have low chronological resolution, which means probably in the order of 200, 300, 400 years. Um, but what you do have, in, in contrast, is that you have a, a large data set of, uh, of sites to understand patterns uh, at a regional scale. So they are really complementary. They shouldn't be sort of one or the other. And coming to what were our research questions to begin with, well, our main idea was to try to look at um, major processes in Anatolian archaeology, which include sedentism, urbanization, state formation, and the beginning of imperial entities in a, a regional context. So we know from, from the Konya plain, I mean, you all know Chataluk and Bonjuklo, and they are extremely well excavated, but we know very little of what happened around them. For instance, so we wanted to, to see what happened. How do you see these these processes in the landscape? And also, we wanted to understand specifically how human society affected the landscape. And we we, we think you know today is of course a, is a big topic, and we always think that is something recent that we started doing. But actually, what I will try to to, to show is that it started very early on, and um, specifically for the Konyaplin, because it's a semi-arid area, they had, uh, ancient societies had always uh, an emphasis on managing water, because water was precious and was important for life and for agriculture. So we, we do have evidence for, for, for water management early on, and I will talk about that. And the last thing that I want to talk today is uh, exchange networks. So we, we are working on some, <clears throat> most of our post fieldwork uh, research is about is about this and we just started so our the results that i will present are not necessarily uh, conclusive but um, I, I, I will I will try to, to do my best for that as well so <clears throat> moving on to to how we did things um actually as i said at the beginning it's a very interdisciplinary team what we have and um so it, it I will try to show that what the, the, the role of uh, an archaeologist today is in part also to coordinate all these sorts of different people and to uh, you know ask the right questions. So you need to know a little bit of everything, which is very difficult, of course, but it's also very rewarding. And um, so before coming to the field, what we did was a, a lot of archival research to understand whatever had been already published in the in, in our specific area, which you see on the left here, but also in the wider region. So what is the context of what we're doing? So we, we, we first established a digital database. You can see the, the screen on the screen on the right here, a quite detailed one. And then I put everything on a GIS platform. So I try to locate each individual site. And then we are using now 
this database to, to, to sort of expand our understanding of uh, sedentism and uh, urbanization at a, at a bigger scale. It just started, but um, that, that's what our aim is. And uh, still before fieldwork to find new sites and you know, better describing what already had been published, we have been working with satellite image among other things. And you can see here different examples of how sites look like in satellite imagery. So this one is a very basic small curve, maybe a hundred meter in diameter. The one on the left is not from our area, but I wanted to show you how, um, you know, you can see ancient roads radiating from, from, this, uh, from this mound. And we have some small examples in our area. The one on the right is actually a very big site, which is quite complex. And there's an acropolis here, a very small acropolis. And then we have a fortified lower town. And then you can see maybe uh, little uh, buried structures here. And that is the outer town. And, and, and lastly, you know, satellite image is also very good to, under, to, to, to spot fortified hilltops. And you can see here the fortification of one of our sites. And what we also do is uh, we use uh, 1 to 25,000 topographic maps because often, especially uh, tell sites are marked on these maps. And we use high resolution digital elevation models because especially Peruk sites and tell sites are visible as little bumps on the, uh, on the surface. And during fieldwork, we have actually a flexible um, field methodology depending on, on the, the nature and the size of the site. So it ranges from, you know, just walking across a small site, if we think that it's a small site, to sort of dividing up in quadrants uh, bigger sites to understand whether different periods are represented in different parts of the site. To, for example, C is, uh, you know, more systematic. Uh, intensive survey where we, we sample all the pottery every 50 meters, say. Um, and D is total sampling. And we only did it for a few sites, the last two, because they are very uh, time consuming and energy consuming. So we are trying to adapt um, our methodologies to, to the site itself and to what we can get out of that. And of course, what you see here in the bottom right is actually we look at shirts mostly and, and chipstone and we select them and then when we're at home we draw them, we, we, we document them, we, we describe them and blah blah blah. But when we're in the field work, in the field we also use drone to sort of uh, capture um, the, 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 the surface of some of the most important sites that we, we have in our area. And so you see here two different examples of how um, good they look and, and how useful uh, they are for, for more detailed analysis. And this on the right is Turkmenkare, which I will be talking a little bit about. And having these uh, 3D models allows us to understand site formation in a lot more detail. And so, for instance, on the left, this is a, a fortified site, and you can see the flat, how, how the, the, the top of the mound is very flat, and, and the, the, the sides of it are very steep. So when you, when you, whenever we see a very steep mound with a very flat surface, now we know that it is fortified, because fortification keep uh, the mound from eroding. Um, so normally, a lot, most of the mounds are are very gentle, the, the slope are very gentle because they are very eroded. Uh, so, so it is important also to understand taphonomical processes. So post-depositional processes, how the, 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 the site existed after it was abandoned. And I think uh, during field work, this is only, you know, it's very expensive. So we only do it in very uh, targeted systematic um, in targeted sites, we do geophysics. And this summer we did the geophysics at Turkmen Karayuk, which is a site we want to excavate. You see on the left, the raw data and on the right, our interpretation of the data. Uh, and you can see even in the raw data that there, are, there is a lot of structures um, just under the surface. We were lucky in this sense. And there is also streets. So 
And this is also possible doing so. And um, we also find quite a lot of um, inscriptions, both Roman, uh, Hellenistic, but in this case, in two cases, we have um, Luvian inscriptions, hieroglyphic Luvian inscriptions. And we used uh, RTI, um, which is a, um, you know, a specific way of using a, a normal photo um, camera to uh, enhance uh, the, the, the surface of this inscription for, for the philologists to, to be able to read them better. And after field work, we, we do a lot of even also traditional uh, work, which in, includes typologies, chronotypologies, and you know, uh, just publishing um, um, period-wise uh, ceramic and chipstone uh, papers. But also what we started doing a couple of years ago is trying to understand in more detail um, provenance of specific uh, classes of artifacts, including obsidian, which is very easy because we, uh, there are very few sources of obsidian in Turkey, including in Cappadocia and in Hida and Goluda, and then there is uh, Milos and there is an Indiana Island, and then there are sites in Eastern Anatolia. So, we have been uh, looking on at our chipstone assemblages to see where they were originating. And the same goes also for pottery. Uh, in some cases, uh, specific chemicals within the pottery can tell us where the pottery comes from. So we, we have been doing some provenance analysis and also specifically for, for pottery and, and, and obsidian, also technological analysis of how were they made. And so you can see on the left here, we do petrography to understand the, the composition of pottery, but we do also um, yeah, FTR, which uh, allows us to understand the temperature at which pottery, pottery was fired. And of course, the higher the temperature, the more difficult it is. And so the more specialized production has to be. And you see in these pictures, we also look simply visually at uh, clues for how the things were made. So in, in, in the number five, you can see that how the, 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 the handle was plugged in to the, 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 the body of the, of the pot. Uh, in number eight, you can see that, 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 that this, the, the, this um, marks of hand marks when, when the pot was smoothing the inside of the pot. On the left, you can see they were scraping uh, two um, surfaces to, to join parts of the pot together and to weld them together better. So we are interested in how they were making things as well. Now to, to start moving slowly toward the results, which uh, is uh, hopefully going to be more interesting for you, uh, setting the stage in terms of what the landscape looked like. And the Konya plain, which you can see here, is currently the driest area in the whole of Turkey. And uh, um, average rainfall is 280 millimeters per year, which is just above what is traditionally considered in, in the Near East, the limit for rain-fed agriculture. So to, in order to grow wheat and barley without the need for irrigation. But this is just, you know, a number. And in fact, a lot of the time today, a lot of the years, it goes beyond uh, the, the, this value. Uh, and so there is, and, and, and this probably was only marginally better earlier in the Holocene, in, in the Neolithic and the Calcolithic. It was wetter, but not that much wetter. So in the Konya Plain, communities always had to deal with where to find water, specifically in summer months. And um, this is a, a close up of uh, southern central Anatolia. So this is Konya on one side and Nidia on the other. And Mersin is just on the uh, Mediterranean coast here. And uh, what you can see is that most of this area is steppe. And there are only a few alluvial basins, which are created by uh, the deltas of rivers coming down from the Taurus Mountains. And the Taurus Mountains are here at the bottom. And all of the modern towns and cities are actually within these alluvial uh, plains. And the same is for all the biggest sites in the past. And in fact, the vast majority of sedentary settlements that we find 
in the Konya plain, they are within uh, these uh, alluvial plains. Meaning that, you know, in the steppe, that there is a lot of fragmentation in the steppe, uh, but it's mostly for hunting, mostly for, not, not for sedentary life, just it's, it's a seasonal fragmentation. So this is the Konya plain that we will be discussing a little bit more. And this is a close up of the Konya plain and the different ecological niches that we find here. So to, to begin with, the Charshamba River is the major water course in the area. It's not very big, but it's the one that provides the most water and the biggest delta. So the whole region is an indirect basin, meaning that there is no water going to the sea. All the water goes into the middle of the plain and then either evaporates or goes down into the groundwater. Now around the Chashamba and other uh, rivers, you, you can see these alluvial soils which are fertile and wet and they are conducive to agriculture. And then there is a narrow strip of uh, spring-fed Piedmont here, marked by this line, where water from the, from the, 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 the mountains uh, surfaces um, and then there is a lot of springs so now and, and so this is also where we see a lot of um, sites and otherwise uh, there is step all around which uh, is not conducive to agriculture and then it all the area is surrounded by mountains which also provides some sort of protection from other communities other groups around and I will show how fortified sites are actually controlling access to and from the plain in the highlands. And because of Chataluyuk, essentially, we do have a lot of publications about environmental and climatic history of the Konya Plain. You can see here some of the um, studies. And so this is also what informed us in, in our analysis. And we also added uh, um, a little bit as well. And so one of the most important uh, aspects of the Konya Plain is that until 50,000 BC, it was covered by a lake. Um, that means that there is no surface in the Konya Plain that is, that is datable to before 50,000 BC. So whatever archaeological evidence we have is from after this period. And uh, you see these this, uh, red lines, they are paleo beach shores. So we can date both through the coring that had already been uh, published and our understanding of the paleo beaches, we can date the contraction of the lake during the Holocene. So around 10,000 BC, it start contracting and then uh, in the early uh, Aceramic Neolithic, it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. At the same time, the, the, the Charshamba here and the Mai rivers, they start expanding their delta. As, as, as the, the lake contract, their delta expands. And we can date this expansion by also by the presence of settlements that are in, in this area. And, and so while this, this part of the, the rivers are from the Pleistocene, from before 15,000 BC, you know, that especially the Charshamba River is essentially created between the Aceramic Neolithic and the Lake Hakolitic. And in terms of history, uh, we know from, from, uh, from uh, all the palynologic and analysis, pollen analysis done in the area that in the early Holocene, uh, at the time and before the time of Chataluyu, actually, it was a richer environment savanna-like, or what you would imagine today in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. You know, today, of course, in, in Africa, you have lions, you have gazelles, you have, uh, you have uh, giraffe. This is not the case in, in Konya, but you would have had wild aurochs, which is the, the wild uh, ancestor of the cattle. You would have had wild horses, wild asses, leopards, you know, very species-rich environment which gradually degraded first into steppe and then into degraded steppe. And so this, this phenomenon is partly natural because uh, there is a, a, a progressive aridification of the whole of the Near East from 9000 BC to present, but clearly this is also human-induced. 
and then we will talk a little bit more about that as well. And last <clears throat> slide about the landscape is that around the Deconia Plain, which is this area here, you have a lot of resources, some of which we will be discussing, uh, including salt, including obsidian, including a lot of metal specifically uh, around the, the, the Taurus in Nide, in the Nide area, and, and, and the wood in the highlands here. And this has, of course, prompted the Konya Plain communities to collaborate and interact with, with groups around them to, to acquire some of these resources. So now, starting to look at, uh, how, how am I doing with time? Yes, half an hour, okay. Um, looking at uh, trends in social complexity, which what, what prompted actually our, our project, uh, we start our history uh, during the Asarabic Neolithic, which, as I said, is the first period that we can really clearly document after the, the, the late retreats. And we are lucky enough to have uh, quite a lot of data for this phase. Um, and you probably know that, uh, you know, uh, after 9000 BC is when uh, we start seeing the beginning of uh, plant domestication um, in, in, in the Fertile Crescent and contemporary in, in, in Central Anatolia. And Bonjukluhayuk, which is excavated by Douglas Baer, is one of the earliest uh, sedentary communities in Central Anatolia together with Ashekla. And it's very well documented. <coughs> and <coughs> it is the earliest phase is dated to 8500 BC, approximately. <coughs> And what is interesting is also another site is excavated, has been excavated, Panarbasha, and it's contemporary with Bonjuklu, and it's totally not sedentary. There is no evidence for domestication, there is no evidence for <coughs> sedentarism. It is a, a temporary encampment. Uh, <coughs> and what our um, researchers discover is that there are Hayuk sites in this phase in the delta, which are probably sedentary, and they're probably starting to experiment, adopting what is already known about dom plant domestication and starting to experiment with animal domestication. But there are also other communities around them in the steppe, which are still hunter-gatherers. And Pinar Bashir provides a very good example of that. And a recent uh, um, study by Douglas Baird and others on uh, isotope from Bonjuklu and Panarbashe and ancient DNA indicates that <clears throat> these people were in contact because there are a few people that possibly lived in the delta, but they were living, but they were buried in Panarbashe and vice versa. So there is some interaction, but they are they have a different diet, they live in different places, and also from a gen DNA uh, perspective, they are different, different communities. So <clears throat> this is important to understand how the Neolithic package is adopted in Central Anatolia. So there are, there are communities that are earlier than other in adopting it. And, and, uh, and, and Bonjuklu uh, specifically shows us that the ones that were uh, sedentary were also in better suited context. I mean, the, the, the delta was very wet, very conducive to agriculture, while the step there was not. So it, it was about different niches, ecological niches they were living in. And if we move on to the, to the Potter Neolithic, which is, uh, you know, seventh millennium, there's Chataluk, which everybody knows, is, you know, Chataluk is very important because he is one of the earliest complex villages in the whole of the Near East. It's one of the largest settlements in the Near East. And um, it shows a similar pattern. So, so Chataluk is a fully sedentary, fully domesticated um, environment, but we still have at the same time communities that do not fit with that picture. They are still hunter-gatherers. And the, the same um, the same um, study by Douglas Bear also shows that there is interaction, but there are different communities. So the idea uh, before, um, before this study and before our survey is that Chataluk was alone in, in, in the Konya Plain. So there was no other uh, large, there was no other sedentary site. And that Ponarbasha was 
a group of people from Chatalut that were going there for the summer months. But uh, now there is plenty of evidence that there are other communities that are unrelated to Chatalut. So, so th this process of uh, neolithization lasts for, for a couple of millennia. It's not something sudden that happens and everybody in that area acquires a neolithic way of life. Um, so when we move to the early Calcolithic, let's say 6,000 to 5,500 BC, what we see here is there is a lot more sites than in the Neolithic. You see here the, the, the Neolithic uh, settlement are just restricted in one part of the delta. In the early Calcolithic, they are in, in, in other places as well. And they ex specifically, what is very important, they expand to the highlands as well. And you can see that they are mostly associated with water, and, and that is very normal. I mean, I, I think that until the, the, the Roman period, there are very all sedentary settlements are very tightly associated with water. And what tells this tells us is that um, they felt comfortable enough um, with their knowledge of agriculture to move to less optimal terrain soils. So while the, the, the Neolithic societies were living only in the, what is the, the perfect optimal solution for agriculture. Now they start experimenting with the, you know, the highlands. And so th this is the beginning of the, 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 the agricultural, agropastoral expansion in the Konya Plain. The following period is unfortunately very little known of the Middle and Late Calcolithic is because there is nothing excavated and at the same time, the material culture is very local. We don't have the means to connect uh, the, 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 the development of local communities with what happens in better understood areas around us. But we suspect that, uh, you know, uh, there's definitely an increase in the, in the number of larger villages. You know, they, um, they become, there are several that become the size of Chatalu. And some of them, particularly Seitano and Samihu, they are under what will be some of the largest early Bronze Age centers. So, so there is a process there that we don't necessarily see fully, but we can suggest that at least the fourth millennium is where we, we start to see the beginning of social certification. But really the early Bronze Age <clears throat> is where we see the rise of uh, more complex societies. So <clears throat> let's untangle this. At first, the first thing that I want to show you is that there is a lot more settlement in the early Bronze Age than in previous period. And actually, uh, the, the early Bronze Age apogee of population density is, is unmatched uh, in the Konya Plain until the Roman period. So this is the, the, the most Kalabalik, most densely populated that has ever been uh, the Konya Plain. And this is not only in the Konya Plain, but elsewhere in West and Central Anatolia. And this is possibly to do with uh, very good climatic conditions, in the, especially in the early part of the third millennium, <clears throat> coupled with uh, large improvements in agricultural uh, technologies. So they are able to uh, produce more and produce in, in more marginal areas than they were before. And this is also when we start seeing uh, the first fortified hilltops in the highlands, which I will be discussing a little bit later. But this is a period where we start seeing conflict. And we also see the, 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 the appearance of very large centers. So all the, the squares here are sites that are more than 10 and generally between 15 and, and 25 hectares. So there is a lot of them and they are much earlier than anybody has ever documented before us in, in the whole of Western Central Anatolia. And so before our work, uh, people were considering, you know, Kuloba or Troy, some of the largest sites in Western Anatolia. And you see here there are four and ten hectares respectively. Beji Sultan was always, <clears throat> you know, a, a very big site, but now we have sites that are 30 to 40 hectares, and they're earlier than this in, in Western Anatolia. So we are starting to think that 
the, the process toward urbanism starts earlier in, in central Anatolia than in western Anatolia, <coughs> and much earlier than them commonly acknowledge it. And still, I mean, just to, to, to make a comparison, this size is not sufficient to characterize them as cities necessarily. And Mesopotamian cities in particular are very, very big, much bigger than, than the ones that we have in Anatolia anyway at any time. Even the, in the Iron Age, we don't have cities that look like Uruk. But Ebla, which is in Northern Levant and <clears throat> is from the early Bronze Age, is probably more comparable with some of the biggest set settlements we have here. So we have the rise of centers, competing centers probably, and I want to show you again here, they are normally eight to 10 kilometers apart from each other. So uh, they rise at the same time and they are probably competing for resources. And what already James Mellert in the 1950s uh, realized and what we, we are seeing in much more detail is that during the early Bronze Age, we see evidence for destruction on a massive scale. Uh, probably 30% of all the early Bronze Age sites that we documented have uh, evidence for um, destruction levels. Uh, a lot of ashes, reconstructable pots. Uh, when we have uh, uh, sections of looting pits, we can see that, you know, the half a meter, a meter of uh, ashes in the section. And we took some radiocarbon samples from, from, from these sections and they all class around 2800, 2600 BC. So, <clears throat> and there is five or six that we already dated in this way. So possibly at some point uh, within the, these two centuries, there is a lot of conflict. And after this conflict, there is fewer centers. Some, some of the centers are abandoned and only few centers uh, survive. So, so we think that this is about competition for resources and, you know, possibly city-states are starting to, to form uh, toward the end of the third millennium. And <clears throat> this, is, this is very likely what it is in the early second millennium, during the Middle Bronze Age. We have one or more city-states in the Konya Plain, and certainly Konya Karayuk, which is excavated, as what we could consider the first city is around 70 hectares and uh, uh, excavation revealed evidence for um, central land administration with seals and uh, with ceilings <clears throat> and uh, possibly its name is Kuwanira, uh, which slowly uh, transformed in Konya across the ages. And, and, and that makes Konya actually one of the oldest continuing continuing to occupy cities in Turkey and in the world. It has at least 5,000 years of history, Konya. Um, so first city, first sort of possible city-state. And what we see here is that <clears throat> there is a clearly coordinated regional defense system. So these hill fort sites, they seem to be protecting the whole of the Konya plain. So if you can see here, this is the, the early Bronze Age Hillford sites, these squares, and they already seem to be encircling uh, the, the Konya Plain. But in the, in the Middle and the Late Bronze Age, they clearly do, and the system continues in their Iron Age, and actually beyond our um, scope, but also in the Hellenistic period, and in the, in the sort of uh, medieval period. And on the right, you can see an example of such 45 sites. Um, most of them are multi-period, so they are continuously or, or, or occupied in different periods because <clears throat> they occupied the best position to actually see over the main accesses into the plain. And uh, actually, this is not unique for the Konya plain. It is a similar network, defense network exists also um, in Western Central Anatolia, but this is the earliest uh, so far. So it starts around the mid of the third millennium. And so <clears throat> this also informs us about, you know, the, the, the level of complexity that these uh, uh, societies were undergoing. So at the same time as this fortification network appears, we also have big centers appearing, we have 
conflict, evidence for conflict. Um, and in the early second millennium, we have uh, city, uh, cities appearing. So it is a slow process, a gradual process, but um, it takes probably 500, 600 years. But by the early second millennium, we probably have a couple of city-states in the current plain. <clears throat> what happens in the late Bronze Age is that uh, this area is, um, uh, is probably occupied by the Hittite kingdom. And uh, this is what the Hittites call it, uh, the lower land. Uh, it becomes a province in the 14th century. And uh, possibly Turkmen Karayuk, which is the new city in the area. So the, the um, Konya Karayuk is abandoned. And then, you know, the center of power, regional center of power shifts to Turkmen Karayuk, which in this period, uh, blooms from being a, a 30 hectare site to be a 130 hectare site. So we believe that this might have been the provincial capital of the lower land because it's by far the largest site in the whole of southern central Anatolia. The Konya Plain is also the kingdom, the, the core of the kingdom of Tarantasha in the 13th and 12th centuries, um, which is originally part of the Hittite kingdom and then separates and antagonizes the last uh, kings um, of Hatti uh, just before the collapse of the Hittite empire. And uh, just to, to show you how big is Turkmen Karayuk, actually there are only two sites that we know of today that are bigger than it and they are Kutepe and Atusha. All the other sites that we know and that have been investigated in a sufficient level of detail, including Ajami, Gordon, Karkemish, Sekeli, Bejesota, they're all much smaller than Turkmen Kare. So it was clearly a major regional center. And uh, it was, you know, in the middle of the Tarantasha kingdom. So we know approximately the borders of, of this kingdom from uh, the, the bronze tablet. It is a treaty between Tarantasha and the Hittite kingdom. And it describes in very much detail where the border runs. And so, so the, the, the red line here is, is what we know of the border and Turkmen Karayuk is here. So it is possibly uh, to be identified with the city of Tarantasha. Um, during the Iron Age, um, what we see uh, is that uh, Turkmen Kare remains the, the major center and there are overall fewer centers um, uh, across the Konya Plain. And what we see instead is that there is a rise of a, a lot of smaller settlements. And actually, from the material culture point of view, these settlements are very um, kabat, coarse. There, there is nothing, there are no fine wares, they are small, they are, they are possibly just farmsteads that are uh, there to feed the, 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 the rising urban population of Turkmen Karay. And toward the end of the Iron Age, we also see a, a reorganization of the settlement patterns and we see the, uh, the, the colonization of the steppe in this area here, which had never been um, occupied before. You can see here there is empty and suddenly we see appearance of these sites and we think it might, might be connected with the irrigation during the, the Persian period. And uh, what we know of Artapu is we discovered an inscription here at Turkmen Karayu which describes his uh, vict military victory. So we know now that in the Konya Plain there is a, there is a Iron Age kingdom that is contemporary with Tuwana and Bipurutaj and with the Phrygian kingdom of um, Midas the First. Um, so that, that was a super exciting discovery, I have to say. Um, and we are working on that to understand exactly how it affects our understanding of political geography. But what I was trying to say before is that we, we see a reorganization of, of uh, land use is that uh, both in the Konya Plain and uh, also elsewhere in northern Syria, we see a shift between Hoyuk sites and flat sites. So 
Periodic sites are in black and the flight sites are in white. And um, what we think it is, it has to do with um, a social change. So the, these new sites are um, not worried with the fence. So the, the, the Hayuk sites are generally, they have the fences, they are higher up. Um, so there is less, uh, uh, fewer preoccupation about the fence, which makes sense if they're within an empire that they don't need to be defended by, constantly defended by attacking enemies. But also, um, they don't need to be sheltered by flooding. And, and, and probably that's also a reason, um, because we, we know that there is a, a much better irrigation system, so the lower flooding, um, possibility of flooding. And but we also think that the shift marks uh, a shift from self-sufficient communities uh, that, that were you know, um, independent or relatively autonomous from the central government to settlements that become dependent on cities. So the, they produce food for cities and in exchange they, they receive um, um, finished products. And this is not a, a change that we only see in the Konya Plain, but um, why, more widely across the whole Near East. And as, as I was mentioning, this, this, we start seeing this in the context of imperial entities. So when the, the, the Achaemenid uh, conquest appears around 500 BC, this is when we start seeing this process, but it continues in the Hellenistic and Roman periods as well. So now just discuss, so this is what uh, our understanding of political, social political trends are. And now um, I would like to, to discuss a little bit our uh, results uh, regarding uh, the impact of uh, human societies on the landscape of the Konya Plain. Um, and how do we do this? Actually, there are several methods to track landscape modification. The most common are using pollen and, uh, and uh, our geological corings to, to track changes in uh, sediments. Um, through time. So isotope data, uh, palynological data, uh, but also, you know, um, sediment differences um, that, that tell us about the climate and, and the environment. And also when we have excavated sites, we look at paleobotany and zooarchaeology to understand how plants and animals change in time as a reflection of changes in the landscape. So <clears throat> the first thing that we can notice in terms of the impact of human societies is that when we start having the first agricultural societies, um, we, we also see a modification of the natural environment from, you know, a totally wild environment to a progressively more uh, humanized environment. So from, from the early Neolithic, when we have very few sedentary communities, to the Roman period when we had a lot of them, uh, you know, the, 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 the natural landscape contract and the humanized landscape increase. And we have to see that around each community there would have been a, a radius of fields. This, so this is a, a radial field system from the Ottoman period. Uh, but uh, I'm sure that it was very similar in, in the Bronze Ages, even in the Neolithic. So we would have a system of roads radiating from the settlement and fields, um, maybe two or three kilometers from the site. So what does this do is agricultural fields, they, they, they prevent from wild plants to exist in a way. So, and, and also uh, they, uh, uh, farmers need to um, eliminate uh, bushes and trees to make space for, for agricultural fields. So what agriculture does is increase the forestation, but also topsoil erosion because there is no more grass or vegetational cover that, that prevents rainfall to, to, to erode away the topsoil. And more in general, we have a loss of biodiversity, meaning that we have fewer plant species around simply because there is more domesticated species that compete for the same habitat. And this, this pattern is accelerated after the Persian period, when because of, for taxing purposes, we start seeing communities 
just um, planting taxable cereals uh, because uh, taxes were often uh, just in props, right? Instead of paying silver, they were paying in amount of um, wheat and barley. And we, saw, we see this for sure in the Ottoman period where from, from this fragile landscape project, we know uh, we, we have translated the uh, uh, tax register and we know that the vast majority of production, agricultural production in the Konya Plain is wheat and barley. So another problem um, uh, is uh, with animal husbandry. So the more uh, sheep and goat there are, the more um, wild plants are eaten and, and prevented from growing, especially because they, they, they like to eat um, the early shoots of plants. If there is a lot of um, um, flocks in the area, there is fewer um, plants in general. And, um, and especially what we see is that there is a rise in thorny grasses across time. Um, so, so grasses that sheep and goat tend not to eat. So what we are, what, what I was talking at the beginning, the, the, the shift between savanna and degraded stuff is in large part due to uh, animal husbandry and overgrazing. Um, so in time, the steppe becomes less and less healthy. And also what we know from excavated sites in southern Anatolia is that uh, between 3000 and 1000 BC, so during the Bronze Age, we see the disappearance of all large mammals that existed in the area due to overhunting, but also, you know, from the restriction, the gradual restriction of wild habitats available for these uh, species. So we, in, in Chatalu, we have a lot of leopard calls, for instance, or aurochs, and we, we, they disappear, they simply disappear in time. And this is clearly human induced. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, probably one of the most important uh, uh, impacts um, of uh, human groups in the area is um, the, 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 first, the heavy deforestation um, that we see starting from the third millennium onward. So we see uh, an opening of agricultural landscape even higher up in the highlands uh, than before, and a decrease in the woodland cover. And at the same time, uh, we also see uh, the expansion of uh, domesticated tree species, like olives, like grapes, um, <clears throat> which also decrease the amount of wild species around. And one <clears throat> specific uh, reason for deforestation is actually mining, metal mining. Um, from 3000 BC onwards specifically, we know that there are three major mining districts in the area. One is the Susma district and the Bolkarda and Alada districts uh, near Nide. And to smelt all sorts of metals, you need a lot of wood. Um, and and that, that is the, the main reason for deforestation uh, around uh, mining settlements and mining facilities. And we know again from uh, Ottoman sources that as, as soon as uh, there is a, a reopening of these mines during the Ottoman period, uh, in, in the space of two or three generations, uh, there are no more trees. And so they had to, to stop uh, mining metal there. And last, and a last um, reason for deforestation is actually during the Roman period, we know they were using the Taurus Mountains uplands, specifically here and here, for cedar, for uh, sheep building. And so this is another phase where we see a lot of deforestation. So overall, it's, while it is difficult to quantify, uh, we see that with the increase of population, uh, and population pressure, and with better technology to exploit resources, and with higher social social political complexity, and therefore the ability to coordinate bigger uh, projects of landscape modification, we also see a, a huge decrease in biodiversity. And biodiversity, I mean the the the, the, the range of wild animal and plant species. 
And uh, this is not something that's specific to the Konya plain, but it is of course important uh, for us to think about it, that this, this is not something that has, has been happening since the Industrial Revolution only. This is a process that has continued for a very long time. Um, <clears throat> moving on briefly to, to our understanding of how they were managing water in, in, in the area. Um, what we know from Chataluyu is that uh, there was a lot of marshland near the site, probably because there were a lot of small um, oxbow channels and small uh, river channels around it. They were creating a lot of standing water. Um, and from uh, phytolith uh, analysis, so phytoliths are the, the hard shell of um, uh, plant cells that remain in the soil, and their size tells us whether they were um, growing in wet or dry environment. So what we know from, from this analysis is that there were parts of the crop of Chatalu that were grown in, in, in wet environments. So that's where we're probably planting them after seasonal spring floods. And so at the very bare minimum, they had a knowledge of how to use uh, floods in their favor, but the, the, the fact that there was a lot of marshland around them suggests that there might have been uh, small drainage works um, around Chatali. We don't have any direct evidence for it, but there is definitely evidence of similar technology in the, in the Levant. So it is possible that it existed. But our first evidence for irrigation is from uh, the, the, the third millennium. So here you see sites, the, the, the pre, pre third millennium sites, and you see that they all exist just within either the spring fed Piedmont or the, the, the alluvial plains, but specifically in the third millennium, uh, a string of new sites appear here, which is possibly suggested with a single canal connecting the Mai River with the Meram River deltas. And also during the Persian period, we see an incredible expansion of sites in the steppe. So I think there are two phases of irrigation, one in the third millennium and one around 500 BC with the Persians. And <clears throat> both of these phases are actually marked by um, their spatial proximity to what are today the major uh, irrigation channels today, marked here. As an additional uh, evidence, in the third millennium is where the Charshamba River starts, stops to flood. So there is no more flooding after 2500 BC. And we know this from geological coring. And, and so this suggests that we're doing something to prevent it from flooding. And uh, in other areas, Kutepe, for example, we both have textual and paleobotanical evidence for irrigation starting from the late millennium. So they, they clearly had the technology in, in Anatolia to do this. Uh, but you know, the, 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 the larger expansion of, of the irrigation system in the Konya Plain is probably during the Persian period. But we do also have evidence for um, large projects uh, from the Hittite period. And, and this is the Koilu Tulu Dam, which you can see on the right. This is not our work. This is uh, Amin Karma Shah's work. And uh, you can see here a reconstruction of where it would have uh, inundated. And it's actually as big as you know, uh, modern dams in the area. So they clearly had um, complex technology uh, to, 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 uh, and, and for, for these enterprises. And the very last slide about the results, exchange networks, we will be just talking about obsidian and pottery here. So this is um, um, <clears throat> sites with obsidian that we have. And through a PXRF analysis, we can see, say without uh, any doubt that um, all of our obsidian comes from Cappadocia, from the Nizida and Goluda. But what is interesting is that while the, 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 the sites in the Konya plain take it mostly from Goluda, the sites in the lake region take it mostly from the Nizida. And there is no uh, logical reason for doing this because they are actually very close to each other. So what it suggests to us is that they different groups had different um, uh, 
exchange networks so that they, they, they resisted in time because this is not only in a specific window of analysis, it continues also in the, in the Bronze Age. So between the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, these communities here were taken from Nenezida and our communities were taken from Golida. So it suggests that um, there were other factors involved, probably of knowing people, you know, uh, from one place or another had an effect on from whom you wanted to, to, to get your uh, exchanges with. And, but what is uh, probably more interesting for us is that over time, from the Neolithic to the, the, the late bronze uh, iron age, we see a decrease both of obsidian versus chert. So they tend to use more chert in later period than obsidian. Uh, and also there is fewer amounts of chip stone overall uh, here on the right. So um, in time, while, while at the beginning of the Neolithic, uh, obsidian was a prestige good. So everybody wanted obsidian also to show off. It was not necessarily simply an utilitarian tool, but also a, a, a sign of prestige. When metal starts to, to be used, obsidian sort of lost its value. So there is less and less obsidian uh, in later period, but also uh, chipstone is only used for threshing sledge, while uh, metal tools they start to be using instead of obsidian tools. So we see this um, in our area. And um, the last <coughs> a few slides uh, are about dedicated to understanding the exchange network of a very specific uh, ware uh, from the thermillion. It's called the Ponyabisin metallic ware. And you can see here the red dots are where we know it existed. It's a very peculiar, very different from other contemporary pottery productions and um, ha has a very specific uh, technological way in which it was made, which we don't see in other uh, contemporary wares. And uh, it is very widespread. So we did some analysis and actually PXRF indicate that they are very homogeneous. So all the metallic wares from all the area are, are made with exactly the same recipe. And they're also fired at higher temperature than contemporary non-metallic wares. And they're, they all have the same technology. So this suggests to us that there have been very few manufacturing centers which were in somehow in communication with each other and they use the same technology and the same ingredients. And if you look at their <clears throat> typology, we see that there are two main groups. One is in the East and one is in the West. So we think that there are two production centers, one in the West and one in the East. But they were clearly uh, communicating with each other. And <clears throat> that also means that each had quite a large exchange network. Normally, pottery is exchanged over maybe 10, 20, 50 kilometers. And these are maybe 100, 150 kilometers. So they were prestige items uh, for sure. And uh, actually <clears throat> looking into this phenomenon, we realized that, that the, our metallic were, were part of a much larger phenomenon that involves the whole nearest. And you see here different areas where metallic wares exist. And they are all connected with improvement in technology regarding heating uh, and that so kilns and, and ovens and that has to do with possibly metallurgical innovations um, around this time <clears throat> and what we can see for, we can say for sure that now so through our analysis we know that this is the first specialized ceramic production in Anatolia and it happens at a time where we already know that there are the first big centers, there is a lot of conflict, there is a sort of um, conflict for, for resources and competition over land. So, so this is the beginning of complex societies in Anatolia and we now see it from many different angles. And so <clears throat> to very briefly conclude, I, I hope that I have managed to show how surveys can be multidisciplinary and also very complex. 
and that they can contribute significantly to uh, you know, archaeological debate uh, about major theoretical issues, uh, specifically in Anatolia. And the uh, <coughs> service have their, are at their strongest when they provide uh, a diachronic uh, comparison of different contexts and where they use large data set and they are focusing on larger areas and then they integrate also paleoenvironmental data because this is this is what they can do best while their 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 weaknesses are that, that there is very little uh resolution chronological resolution and that we only can work with limited amount of material cultural classes which is pottery chipstone you know and the site themselves and so we have a limited understanding uh regarding what happens within the settlements and at the individual level, but we have a better understanding of what happens at the um, larger level. And with this, I thank you uh, for listening and I would like to thank the, our team and our sponsor for being uh, so kind and enthusiastic for the last five years. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Questions, I mean, uh about this presentation. So Ali, I think that this is a, a period that you are specifically interested in, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was very interesting. Thank you. No, but uh, I mean, for this the presentation. is a for, uh, Not just for the Bronze Age, but for the whole areas, it was very uh, informative and actually uh, you explained very well how this technique works because I, I was I had questions about this, this general survey technique, but now I can understand that it uh, creates a big part of the future archaeology. Uh, and I would like to ask you, what do you think about the uh, future of this technique? What can else be done, and what are the other technologies that we can use in, in survey? You mean? Yes, I, I mean survey. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, something that we didn't do at all was uh, doing a geoarchaeology. So, you know, you could combine because there was already a lot of work done for pan environment in our area. We didn't really um, need to to do geoarchaeology, but if you do coring um, of you know other uh, river deltas or lakes or, or other situation. You can have a better understanding of paleo environment and how you know the <clears throat> land land forming processes so erosion sedimentation and uh you know um hyd hydrography you can have a better understanding if you do geoarchaeology so that is definitely one thing you can also uh put in a survey um what else um yeah i think that you can work a lot more on uh on post field work um, analysis so working on the materials um, you, you know for example you could do lipid analysis which is uh, it is about understanding the use of pottery specific pottery vessels so where they use for for cheese making where they use uh, they were containing oil where they containing wine so residue analysis would be another venue Yes, I cannot think of something else. Yeah, yeah, I was asking for because uh, last day we were just discussing with a fellow uh, archaeology students and we were talking about this surveys replacing excavations because uh, they are just uh, requires much less resources and they're, they're scanning much wider areas. So it's, mm -hmm. it's very, for a scholar, it's very uh, logical to do the survey, but we, we also have some doubts about uh, the t technique as a, is, it, uh, is it enough to get some data by just looking at the uh, surface without excavating it? Yes, I mean, I was trying to make the point there that you cannot uh, substitute survey with excavation or excavation with survey, right? So the, 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 the sort of result that you get from excavation are different from the one that you get from survey. So I totally disagree that we should stop excavating. 
because now, I mean, with, with the technologies that we have today, even when you do geophysics, which is a way of looking at the, at the what, what is in a site without excavating it, right? But what it tells you is a minimal proportion of what is there. It tells you that there are walls. It tells you there are structures. But what is inside those structures, it doesn't tell you. So you need to excavate it, I think. I think that one has to be careful of where to excavate, how to excavate. So I agree that we should be more careful also in preserving archaeological sites, but I don't advocate not to excavate. Thank you. Thank you for your answer and for your presentation again. So any other uh, question or uh, comment? I think Aziz, you are also uh, one of the students interested on in that period, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yes, actually, uh, I am also interested in the late Bronze Age. Uh, I mean, that was a really uh, comprehensive point of view to uh, get into the case of the service and uh, it was also a complimentary for me and uh, although I had uh, some particular questions, uh, they were answered during the presentation. Can I ask something? Of sure. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for the seminar. I know so little about this period. I have a question that is like not really professional, but I really wonder. So you talk about all these experiments, all these you know analyses and everything. I wonder, do you need like a formal or formative training in science, or do you just ask for people to help you in their own fields? Like, how do you do like pollen analysis? How do you know all of this scientific mm -hmm. stuff? Because I'm like really lost in these. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question. No, I don't have a formal training. And in fact, um, sometimes I do struggle. You know, I said, okay, I would like in general to, to know something about provenance of pottery. How do I do it? So maybe I go online and I research and I find articles and maybe some of the articles I understand better than others. And then I look for people that can do this, right? And then we talk with them and uh, I tell them, look, this is what I would like to do. Oh, hi, Thomas. Well, what I would like to do is this. How I do you do propose it. to do it? <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you propose to do it, right? And then it is a, a work in progress. And then maybe we, they already know the, the technique and it's a very um, common technique. Or maybe they say, oh, let's try this. Nobody has ever tried it, but let's try this. And so we, we maybe we, we invent, I, I don't, but they invent something new for the questions that we have. But also, as I was saying it before, in time, archaeologists and archaeologists that has uh, any intention of leading a project needs to know a little bit of a lot of different things, you know, at least to, to be able to ask the right questions. So I don't have any formal training in pollen, palynology but I do know approximately what palynology does, right? So I can first have the idea of using palynology for, for my studies, and B, when I talk with the palynologist, I can sort of ask the right questions. Does it make sense? Yes, it does now, thank you. Hmm. You're welcome. So actually, this is why we are trying uh, for in such a seminar and uh, in other courses, I mean, to cover many fields, at least, I mean, to, to give a, a small base, I mean, for, for you to know in which direction to, to go, because, yes, it's true, I mean, to, to focus on one part of uh, any field, it will not be sufficient, at least if you want to make a, a, a project and to cover yeah. a project. Some more questions or other questions? Can, can I say something else on this? Sorry. Uh, yeah. Just, you know, I think that as, as master students, as most of you are, I think that it would be great if, for, if you want to continue in academia, for you to choose, in addition of being an archaeologist, 
you know, choose a, a sort of specialization that you can couple with your studies so that, you know, um, you can be relevant because, you know, everybody these days knows how to draw pottery or to, to take a picture, you know, so what we, who we are looking, we looking for in our team is people that, you know, do GIS or do satellite image analysis or do paleobotany or do zooarchaeology or, you know, people that both have a, a good understanding of what archaeology is, but also they have specific skills that we don't have. So I think that to advance in, in today's archaeological world, you need to have at least some skills that are, that are complementary to, to, to that. That, that would be my, my advice. Good advice. <laughs> I would like to help actually in the department if it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> so any other, uh, other questions maybe or comments? No, so, well, I have a few, which of course are, I mean, also maybe not very professional because I mean, uh, uh, you are dealing with a period which I'm not uh, uh, knowledgeable at all. But uh, first, I would like to ask a question which is related to your methodology. So, you are making this huge uh, survey. First of all, it is uh, amazing. You are working for four years, five years? Five years. Five, five. years. So it's amazing, I mean, through all the techniques that you have been uh, uh, using, I mean, the precision of the results. I mean, you have uh, some uh, graphics, yeah, yeah. And, uh, the evolution, you understand many aspects of the sites. I mean, this is, of course, very impressive. This is thanks to a teamwork, actually. I mean, this, is, uh, yeah, yeah. this notion of teamwork is uh, very uh, important now nowadays. So if, uh, and oh, as I understood, you would like to make some excavations, what will be, I don't ask you which site you want to excavate, maybe you don't want to say, or maybe you don't know yet, I don't know, but I mean, if, I mean, what will be your uh, motivation to choose one site more than another one? Mm -hmm. That's, yes. Well, I know the site. <laughs> and the site is <laughs> Tukmen Karayuk, which is this uh, very big uh, site that uh, I discussed a little bit about, where we found the inscription. It is, uh, you know, one of the biggest sites in Turkey. Um, in general, I think, you know, uh, I, I would have always have advocated for going for small sites um, before finding Tukmen Karayuk. I actually wanted to, 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 to dig at a small site because most people dig at big sites, right? So we don't have much evidence uh, for how rural communities uh, look like in, uh, in a prehistoric and early historic Anatolia. Because for many reasons, but you know, among which that archaeologists until a couple of few decades ago were rich white men, they were always interested in uh, the palaces and powerful people and uh, um, people that would remind them of them themselves, so you know I would have advocate for uh, for a small site to begin with, and then I, I contradict myself because I want to study the big site, but that's another story. But <laughs> but also I think that um, a site that uh, would um, that, that is relatively uh, untouched, which is very rare today. So there is a lot, of, unfortunately. The last decade in Turkey has been a flourishing of illegal excavations. So people are crazy about uh, excavation. We we are um, we have also a project on cultural heritage and public archaeology um, in Krasp, and uh, so we are trying to talk with the looters and the Defnigila, and um, you know try to to engage with them. But I think that. Um, there is a, an addiction, an obsession about uh, treasure hunting in, in, in Anatolia, in Turkey in particular, and that is uh, very detrimental to, to archaeological heritage. So small sites, well preserved, uh, that they can actually, what I think is important is to have very good research questing for whatever you do. It's like uh, you can excavate whatever you want, you just need to 
not just wanting to excavate something, but why are you excavating something? That there must be some very peculiar reason for doing that. And there could be many reasons, but it has to be not just because uh, you want to be the 200th person to excavate uh, in Pony or whatever. Uh, I think nowadays, especially if you want to attract people that are interested and that are good at their job, you need to have very good understanding of what you want to do. But, and I don't know whether it answers. Yeah, yes, of course. But I mean, you didn't exactly tell us what will be your uh, your reason of the choice. Ah, okay. So the reason to choose Turkmen Karayuk is that we think that it is Tarun Pasha, so the second capital of the Hittite Empire. And uh, so that, that is a, a major reason why we want that. We also, it is also um, completely burnt. Uh, the, 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 low, the top uh, level is completely burnt and it is Hellenistic. And uh, there has been no excavation, Hellenistic site excavated in inner Anatolia um, so far. And burn, uh, burning generally means that you find everything in situ in, in, in a place. And, and it's an incredible troll for archeologists. It's very rare. Normally, what you excavate is rubbish, literally rubbish. You excavate foundations of buildings, you excavate rubbish pits, and that's all. So find having a context where you can see how people were living, that's incredible in itself. So the whole site is burned, was probably attacked by Alexander, we hope. But anyway, in the, in the fourth to third century BC, and uh, so, <coughs> That is another big reason why I want to excavate that. And also that the lower town is very accessible because there is no uh, later periods. And so we would be excavating, uh, you know, residential units and uh, workshops uh, at, the, at the outskirt of uh, an Iron Age town, which is also something <clears throat> that nobody has done. And we are curious about what, what happens. Um, and how it looks like, uh, you know, material culture, daily life, uh, uh, normal people's behaviors and, and beliefs. And, and also because there is so much uh, um, archaeology around the site, within two kilometers from the site, we can excavate, with the same excavation permit, we can excavate at least four other small sites, which are probably Iron Age farmsteads and early Calcolithic small mounds. So we have, um, we have a lot to choose from and we can uh, ask a lot of people to collaborate with us because they would be interested in different theories and different aspects. Yes. And you, are you planning to, um, to continue the survey or do you think that there's a moment that it's possible to say, okay, the, the survey, we cannot go further. I mean, we have reached the limit of our survey. Is it reasonable to think like that, or in fact, you never reach a limit of a survey, like an excavation, except if you go to the to the rock? I mean, <laughs> otherwise, you you don't really finish an excavation. We can extend also. Yes, I mean that is a danger. I would say you know you can continue until the end of your life or your career to do something. Not necessarily that is a good thing, and uh, I think that five years are, are enough for us to 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 have a good understanding of, of the, the dynamics that we wanted to, to research to begin with. Of course, if we had five more years, we would know a bit more. But there is a, there is a point where the trade-off between time and energy spent and what you achieve more is no longer viable, is no longer advantageous. So I think it's a good time to stop. And what I would do if I had the, 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 the means would be to collaborate with somebody to work on post Iron Age period because we wanted to do that, but the ministry didn't allow us. So I, I would be very curious to see what happens after what we discovered. <clears throat> and because ultimately my idea of archaeology is, that, is to connect the past with the present. And, you know, I would like to see what happens in between 500 BC and today, um, and then how it connects with modern Konya people and how we can use archaeology to also to inform life today. 
And this is this was also what the fragile landscape project you were mentioning in the beginning is about, is to look at how people were using water in the past to try to affect how people are using water today. Because there is a big problem of water in Konya. And so maybe we can inform policies better. But don't you think that um, since uh, the antiquity, I mean, the, uh, the riverbed, for example, has been changing and uh, so do you think it is really possible, I mean, to, to make a link between the present and the past, considering the uh, water resources? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, the, the, the fragile landscape is, is mostly about uh, Ottoman past, so it's not that far in time, right? And we have a lot of evidence from tax registers, from historical documents about how they were doing things and what they were what kind of crops they were using, where they were irrigating, uh, what kind of structures, you know, dams and stuff that they were using. And so, and also we are collaborating with engineers to calculate the water budget. So whether there was a positive or negative budget, whether they were using more water that they could, than the, the, the rainfall or less water. Uh, and, and actually we are getting very good results. So today, Ciao, Thomas. Goodbye. Bye, bye Thomas. <laughs> Ciao. Thank you very much. I have to leave, unfortunately. I was just <laughs> going in and going out. Thank you for being here. Thanks. Take Hope care. Bye-bye. Ciao. Ciao. Bye-bye. So, yes, I think that uh, we can. We, we can. We are talking with with the farmers, actually, about, about this a lot. You know, because they're using crops that are not local to the corner plane. They're using crops that are not drought tolerant. They're using crops that require a lot of water. They're using techniques of irrigation that are not very efficient. And Ottoman were, were much more efficient than they are. Uh, so there, there is quite a lot that we could do potentially. And also I assume that uh, if you are uh, making a research today, this will involve more the local community and it may also stop uh, illegal excavations. Actually, this yes. can also, I mean, uh, what they do in Kaman, I mean, they are trying to, uh, to make the local population uh, involved because, mm -hmm. I mean, in the preservation of the land, because they understand what is the land, I mean, they, Yes. And, you know, my wife is a cultural heritage specialist, so, so <laughs> she's helping us in this process as well. And, but I realized how arrogant we are in general as archaeologists. And I put myself into that as well. I mean, we think that we know better than um, people that are not archaeologists about uh, their own past. And, uh, you know, so we tend not to engage with people. We tend not to engage with the workers. In a, in a meaningful way, not, uh, you know, we do, of course, engage with workers. We tell them we excavate here, we excavate there, but we don't listen to them. <clears throat> and I think that what we have started doing to listen, listening to them is also enriching what we understand of them, of their past and of archaeology. And, um, and uh, you're right, I mean, it's difficult to change the minds of a looter, I have to say, but at least <clears throat> understanding why they're doing this um, and, uh, you know, and showing them a sort of friendly face they can communicate with, it's important because I think that uh, at least we can transmit some, some message there, maybe to them or to their children, which are generally more open-minded. Uh, but also, looters have a lot of curiosity about their past. So we can also try to channel that curiosity for to do good instead of doing bad, I, I hope. Yes, and uh, you don't maybe not, uh, it's difficult yes, to convince a looter <laughs> not to loot, but I mean, maybe, I mean, by having the, the other people, I mean, around, I mean, the, the community around, which uh, will stop them. I mean, this is, uh, I mean, a, a general. Uh, I can tell you in Turkmenkareu, in the village of Turkmenkareu, out of, 40, 50 people that uh, our colleagues interviewed, 30, 40 were looters. That, that is the amount. <laughs> it's correct. So it's, it's a lot of them. <laughs>
And uh, I have a, also a question, which is uh, more related, I mean, useful maybe for the student. I mean, you, you show that you are doing a digital, a digital database. Do you use hmm. a database which is already existing? Or did you create your own database? I did create, yes. So it's a, it's a, you can also use uh, Excel if you need to, but uh, what we use uh, is an um, access database which is a bit more flexible when you have a lot of data and you need to, to analyze them. But it's not that difficult. I mean, I, I took a course uh, when I was in, in uh, UCL in London. I took a course on how to, to structure a database because it requires some <clears throat> understanding of what you want to do in order to design what, you, uh, what you're going to use. But it's not uh, super difficult. And I think that in today's archaeology, everybody should be using some database, some level of database or data gathering mechanism and some basic statistics. Statistics are very important to synthesize data in an effective way. So database and statistics are two sides of the same coin. Yes, this is something which is really, I think, necessary. And sometimes I have seen some uh, offer for a job and one of the conditions was to know about the uh, database. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, yeah. mm -hmm. so hopefully also this is something that we would like to go. Uh, Aziz, you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, actually I have a question that uh, can be related to your second question, Dominic Hojan. Uh, so, as it is mentioned, someone uh, who is doing survey or even an excavation, uh, must be aware of the fact that the environment is changing. And uh, you mentioned that the mines we find uh, can be milestones for uh, some lost forests. Uh, are there any other milestones that uh, you can mention uh, for us uh, that uh, for the reason that we can be able to uh, assume uh, something when we, uh, when we find them. Because I find this particular uh, situation very uh, challenging uh, without a high knowledge, uh, good knowledge on uh, geology or geography. So, I'll uh, uh, is that in Turkey? Yes, of course. I was talking about the mountains of the mountains and the mountains of the mountains. You said that in other geographic areas, I would like to give you an example. Do you have any other projects? No, it's in the mountains. Hani yok Hadi. olmuş veya değişmiş başka coğrafi özellikler için uh -huh. bunun gibi başka örnek var mı aklınızda? Diye uh -huh. Okay, so yes, um, actually not, not specifically in Anatolia, but there, there is a lot of work done, uh, for example, in Southern Levant or in, in, in Europe uh, of, you know, the environment around known metal mines or salt mines, so, so Hallstatt in, in Europe, and uh, in the Jordan, uh, in the Jordan Valley, um, there, there is a, a clear, always a very clear effect of mines on, on, on forests around because that, that was the only way that they could uh, smelt metal um, in antiquity. They, they needed to use um, other wood or, or charcoal. And uh, so, in excavated mines, you can see also the, the periods of occupation and the periods of abandonment. So um, in, in, in the Jordan Valley, you can see that when the mines are abandoned, there is a sort of regrowth of uh, uh, woodland around it, or not, not necessarily woodland, but you know, vegetation around it. And when, when they start again, they, they, they start shrinking. And so, I think that we can also see that uh, in later periods, or in the Islamic period, in the medieval period, they start uh, importing wood from other areas around. So, so they are aware of the, of the impact and they're trying to mitigate that by organizing 
a network of uh, wood uh, exchange uh, toward the era, or they're using charcoal, which is more effective for the same amount of wood that, that is originally used, you get a higher temperature and therefore less wood. So you, you made the wood charcoal, you know, I say, come here. Um, I don't know, by the way, uh, I got the uh, reason was, uh, what I meant was uh, we can uh, write the atoms of uh, wood uh, to the mines. So uh, are, there any, are there any other uh, specific archaeological uh, finds that we can relate to some other geographical things, like this case? Uh, this was uh, an example that I wanted to uh re -mention. so if there are other examples of uh mines or other example of how other landscapes are affected yes i mean uh, things that we uh, encounter in the landscape that uh, might have been changed uh -huh, okay that have, might have changed the landscape mm -hmm. okay um well i mean quarries uh, stone quarries, marble quarries, and definitely change the landscape. Um, uh, what else? Uh, um, you know, dams. Dams they definitely change hydrographic landscape a lot. And we, we know from from what I showed before. You know, like uh, Hittites were very good at making dams, uh, both in our area, but also in near Chorum and uh, in the Hittite heartland. And uh, uh, dams affect you know, marshland, affect uh, you know, the, 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 the size of flooding and stuff. So when, when you change that, uh, when, when you sort of uh, dry, drain the marshland, all the, the flora and the fauna, the leaves and marshland, birds, water birds, fish, uh, kamush, and all these sorts of uh, vegetation disappears. So that is another example. Um, other examples, um, yeah, sorry, I don't, don't have any other. Thank you so much. So, well, I mean, I, I would like to emphasize one point that, and then ask a question. I mean, it's really interesting for two, I mean, for two questions, you have emphasized the uh, importance of knowing what happened during the Ottoman period. And it's true that it is something for other topics that I'm making for the research myself. It's, I see that uh, there are some clues which are in the Ottoman period. And uh, I mean, when one of you is doing the master thesis or doctorate, it's something you should keep in mind because sometimes we have some answers. It could be, and this is of course not studied enough, I mean, uh, Byzantine text. I mean, the Byzantine text are not really not known, and Ottoman text as well. I will give you an example, which is different, but I mean, uh, at the same time to uh, emphasize that point, I mean, uh, I'm working, you know, on all fronts. okay? So in fact, there are some texts which are very important in uh, Ottoman text about Alphas, because I mean, Alphas, they were traded and when it comes after the Roman period and the church has been uh, taking care of the economy, of the training, production, and so on. And in fact, we have the key of that in the Ottoman archives, in some text, and before that also in Byzantine text. So I feel that when you make a research, of course, it depends what is your research, but I mean, it's something that you, you shouldn't lose. I mean, uh, you, you should keep in your, in your mind. And also, actually, uh, Ottoman and Byzantine period is giving some answer. But uh, you, I mean, in your, uh, in your survey, has been, have you been, uh, did you meet the roads? I mean, you have been showing one on one of your mafia the roads, but in fact, roads are very important, but they are so difficult. I mean, actually, and so many discussions. And it's also a topic that the students shouldn't forget. I mean, in, in yes. the research, but I mean, this is really, I mean, a, a real challenge and probably more even in the Bronze Age, because you no know, my stone, for example. I mean, that was my hope at the beginning, because uh, there are other areas of the Near East, including, for instance, uh, Northern Mesopotamia, where uh, ancient roads, they are called hollow ways, and they are very visible in satellite images. So 
I was hoping that we could find some. But because of the specific geography of the Konya Plain, these roads have been uh, deleted. So, so they've, they've been uh, sort there is a lot of later sedimentation and later reworking of the land. So they are no longer visible in most cases. So we have uh, a very few traces around some settlements. Uh, but in general, we don't have uh, direct evidence for roads, for, for Bronze Age roads. We do have evidence for Roman roads because they are paved, so we, we can follow them. And we do have evidence for bridges, a lot of them. And in fact, what's interesting is that some of the major Bronze Age sites are actually connected with Ottoman bridges. So there were probably fords in the Bronze Age as well as in the Ottoman period. So there were, because the Charshamba River cuts the area diagonally. So the people coming from, one, from east to west, they wanted to cross the Charshamba. And uh, they had to, to, to go through specific points because not everywhere it, it would easily cross. So in these specific points, uh, my suggestion is that sites became more important because there were taxes to be gained by controlling the access to, to, to the fort. So indirectly, we know that, uh, that the, the, the location at least of specific points in the landscape where Bronze Age roads have passed. Yes, thank you. I mean, this is a very important topic, actually. I mean, uh, yeah. but the topic, even when you say that uh, it's easier in the Roman period to find the roads, yes, for me it's a bit easier, but still nobody agrees. <laughs> so, I, mean, yeah. so, I mean, it's really, I mean, uh, a very interesting question and uh, a lot of uh, improvement has been done, but I mean, the, there are still many question, question marks, mm. I mean, on that. Uh, Actually, I didn't show it at all, but we did uh, an analysis uh, called the Total Cost Survey, surface in, in GIS, where we can um, indicate from a natural landscape point of view what, where it is easier to, to travel. And uh, it works very well to guess, to, to, I mean, so the, 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 all the forts that we know are very close in the mountains to the to the access point into the plane. So they are very, <clears throat> this, this method is very good to, to explain why the forts are in that place. But once we get into the Konya plane, there are too, too many variables. And so um, the natural landscape, because the, the plane is so flat, a road can go anywhere. So the, 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 the path of a road is dependent mostly on where they when where they want to go, rather than you know the, the the difficulty of the terrain. So yes, that is in a sense it's difficult to, to predict where a road would go. So do we have any uh, more question or uh, comment? No. So I think that maybe uh, we we can uh, close this uh, seminar. And actually, uh, it was a chance to speak of many different problems i mean it, it, and uh, it can be i i assume very inspiring i mean to 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 see i mean uh, which type of problematic and uh, how to solve it and actually it seems <laughs> it seems that uh, in any case uh, field archaeology is a key to to answer to many many questions i mean this i mean you will not say the opposite i assume but I mean, <laughs> I'm glad that I managed to give that impression. <laughs> I think that definitively so. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thank, you. thank you to you all. Uh, then we are going to meet uh, for this uh, seminar next, uh, next Wednesday. We have our regular schedule, but to some extent, it will be one and a half hours or next Wednesday, face to face. Okay, and uh, it will be about uh, Greek archaeology. I think we have enough of this Bronze Age, and <laughs> so <laughs> so I mean we are going to go to uh, classical archaeology. I mean to um, Greek and Roman. So uh, next week we have one and a half hour with me, and then on Thursday, I'm sorry, it's a bit complicated our program. On Thursday we shall have one and a half hour with uh, Olivier Henry, 
and he will speak on Zoom, he will be in Lyon, and he will speak about his excavations in, uh, in La Manda. So, I mean, uh, I will show, let's say, the classical archaeology, and then we shall see the Greek archaeology in Anatolia, uh, and a specific area of uh, Anatolia uh, with uh, Olive. So, thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you. It was very nice to, to meet you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay, bye.